Hi and welcome back to another episode of Perspective where I Tony from Inner Gallery sit down and talk to amazing friends all over the world to learn new perspectives around Indonesian textile art. And today I'll be talking to Sonia Dahl all the way from Oregon, USA, who is an artist, a writer, and educator. And we'll be talking to her about her experience in Indonesia as well as her works involving indigo dyes. Without further ado, sit back Relax and enjoy Sonia's perspective. All right, thank you so much, Sonia, for doing this again. Uh, how are you doing? There? I'm doing really well. Yeah, now uh, the season is changing here in Oregon, and sometimes there's more sunshine, so that's been very nice. <laughs> uh-huh, cool, nice. Uh, has it been back to normal with the pandemic? Mm, not really. I mean, uh, people are still very careful, but you know the the number of cases of the virus are decreasing right now all over the US so that's been good so people feel a little bit more free but we are all wearing masks and you know mostly staying home a lot of the time still just to be safe but uh, soon we we'll, we will have the opportunity for vaccination so that will be really mm-hmm. wonderful i can't wait <laughs> yes yes me too uh, i can't yeah. wait too Uh, yeah. explore the world again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I miss uh, I miss all the nonkrong that I used to have <laughs> with friends. <Yes. laughs> so we met uh, doing a chat with uh, Meet the Makers uh, on the creative process of Nusantara and uh, one particular artwork uh, catch my eye because I was like researching about uh, natural dye uh, cultures and Yeah, I just would like to find out more uh, about it, and probably yeah. there is like some uh, inspiration or intersections that uh, I might use. Uh, so yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yep, probably we can start with a little introduction about uh, who Sonia is and uh, a little bit about your practice. I work in many different ways. Um, you know, I am an artist. I'm. Uh, I'm American. I live in Oregon in the United States. Um, I am uh, also uh, grew up in Canada. I've lived in Indonesia, and I did a study abroad when I was in college in Italy. So I've I've lived a number of different places, and I think that's really informed my life and and how I think of myself. But um, I am primarily an artist, a visual artist. Um, I work with fibers and textiles, um, sometimes with actual cloth as the material, but sometimes I um, make more experimental artworks um, that uh, maybe use um, uh, something like indigo dye, but with something you wouldn't normally dye with indigo, like uh, bread or rice, and then making large sort of installations out of that. So I, I work in many different ways. Um, as is typical, I think, for a lot of contemporary artists. And I am also a writer. You know, I publish my writing sometimes. Um, and uh, and I'm an academic. Um, I uh, teach at the University of Oregon. Um, I teach two lecture classes about contemporary art and the creative process. So, um, so yeah, I, I work in a lot of different ways. And um, Um, sort of spread out my energy among those different vocations. Yeah. Uh, how uh, do you get started with uh, fibers or what draws you into using uh, fibers and textiles? <sighs> well, I made my way into textiles very intuitively. Uh, I didn't really know what was happening. I think it was a subconscious thing. Um, you know, a long time ago when I graduated from college, I was making photographs and I was making paintings, but I was starting to get very um, impatient with the sort of flat two-dimensional surface. And so I just started um, cutting up my paintings and weaving them together and making sort of um, physical uh, uh, sort of woven creations out of them and collaging photographs. So it slowly started, you know, I think I just started working my way towards cloth Um, I've always been drawn to that very sort of primary textile um, uh, structure of woven cloth. Um, 
And I'm interested in textiles because uh, I feel of all the artistic materials available to us, um, textiles are so intimate. I think they have so much to do with uh, being a human. You know, they are, we are so close to them at all times, you know, whether we're wearing them on our bodies or uh, displaying them in our homes, like uh, the wonderful um, batiks I see behind you, yes. you know, I think, and, and, and humans have, you know, ever since they first began wearing cloth have used textiles and patterns and colors. Um, as ways to communicate identity or um, belonging or uh, ceremony or ritual. So I think textiles are just uh, such a rich terrain. I never get bored of researching and making things with cloth. Um, Interesting. So uh, you actually get yeah. into it almost by accident. Uh, in yeah. Way, yeah. You're just like cutting it out and then uh, weaving yeah. it back. I, yeah, I learned how to weave um, at a retreat center um, I went to when I was in college um, that was run all on volunteers. Uh, it was a sort of spiritual retreat center. And so I went to volunteer in this village in the mountains and they ended up asking me to work in their um, the sort of arts and crafts area. And the first thing I had to learn how to do was to warp a loom because they had all these looms and people would come to be on retreat and then they would, you know, weave some uh, dish towels to bring home or something like that. And so I, I first learned how to weave um, also kind of by accident. I didn't go there planning to learn that, but it, something about it just really uh, stuck with me. Um, and so I kept kind of coming back to that. So yeah, maybe that was subconsciously why I started weaving my paintings together too. <laughs> Is there a yeah. huge indigo culture in the U.S. or how do you uh, get interested in it? You know, I I I wish that I remembered clearly what the first spark was, but I think it was the color. I think I was attracted to the color, the sort of that deep, deep, rich blue. You know, yeah. it's sort of the blue of of the night sky just when it's becoming night. So I think it was the color, and then. I was aware that there was a natural dye. I was starting to get interested in, in natural dyes. Um, so not just indigo, but any number of different plants that you can um, boil and make dyes out of. And so I started researching indigo dye and I had no idea that it was a living substance, that it was a fermentation, that there were all these associations with it so i took a, a class on natural dyes at my local community college um so that i could learn how to use indigo dye mm -hmm. um but that was the, that was the beginning that mm -hmm. was, was there know, like a huge two. uh interest of indigo over there well in the u.s um yeah actually over the last i think maybe 10 years or so mm -hmm. i've seen um a huge amount of interest growing when I was first starting to learn about it. Uh, and it, you know, maybe I just didn't know enough. I did. I wasn't connected enough with the larger scene, but I wasn't finding a lot of information. I wasn't finding a lot of people talking about or sharing on the internet about indigo dye. But I think in the last 10 years or so, um, there's been a lot of interest um, in people uh, not only using indigo dye, but also growing the plants um, from seed and learning how to process them um, properly, which is really hard. Um, you know, and when I say a lot, you know, it's not a huge portion of the population, of course, but um, for something as obscure as this strange dye, um, you know, there has been a lot of interest in recent years. And I think it has something to do with people desiring magic in their lives or something, you know, because indigo is so magical, you know, it's like you put a white cloth into it and it comes out green mm -hmm. and it just turns mm -hmm. blue in the air. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, many, many people teaching indigo dye workshops and a lot of research being done. And um, uh, yeah, so interesting, but you know, the U S our relationship here to indigo is um, mostly through the uh, colonial era. 
um, when uh, people from Europe were coming over and um, taking over the land from the indigenous people who actually lived here and then building plantations, you know, of course, were very famous for the era of um, cotton plantations and rice and indigo dye was another crop that was very profitable. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a very difficult history because it's related to the transatlantic slave trade and some of the parts of our national history um, we're not so proud of, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, indigo was grown um, in the U S as a, one of the early um, kind of plantation mm -hmm. crops. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, uh, we do share uh, almost a very similar history. How indigo mm. is uh, one of like the most prized possessions that was like being traded off, and then mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's definitely is uh, making a comeback in the in the scene. Yeah, because uh, yeah, partly because of like the sustainable awareness. Uh, yeah, yeah, people are going back yeah. to natural dyes and stuff. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, it's been now, I think, five years since the last time I was actually spent time in Indonesia, which is so long. Um, but even then, even in 2016, the last time I was there, you know, I really did see a lot of people, a lot of more, more interest in, yeah, um, sustainable, natural uh, materials and also you know, I found a lot of people when I was traveling around Indonesia and talking to weavers and dyers and artists that um, there was a lot of interest in sort of relearning and reclaiming uh, traditional um, art forms that, you know, had it been interrupted by the colonial period, um, you know. But they brought the Dutch brought synthetic dyes, right? And oh, why not use these? Are so easy. You can get such beautiful colors. But then when you stop using the natural dyes and cut down all the dye trees and the plants, then your tradition sort of gets cut off. So I and that's that happens. That's happening all over the world. You know, in the United States too. Yeah. And is that uh, also like about the same period where you kind of like discover Indonesia or? Or how, how do you end it up in Indonesia? Yeah, that's also a really good question. No, that came much later. It also began very, what would seem sort of randomly, but um, through uh, scholarship, through, I was, um, I was in school again for a short period. Um, and my mentor, I was very interested in indigo dye at the time. So I had already started working with indigo dye. And this was maybe oh. around 2000. Nine, I had started working with Indigo maybe in 2007, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long time. Um, but I was, I was making all these things with Indigo dye and everyone was always asking me, well, why is this blue stuff so important? And I got so tired of having to try and articulate, you know, why is this dye matter so much to me and why should anyone else care? Um, and so my mentor was trying to help me find resources. And so he shared um, an anthropological article actually by a woman named Janet Hoskins, um, who had um, you know, spent her life's work uh, living in uh, Sumba in Eastern Indonesia. And um, she wrote this beautiful uh, article about the um, indigo dye culture, the, the female-centered indigo dye culture in um, areas of uh, West Sumba. And that article was so influential on my thinking because it opened up my realization that not just indigo dye itself, but, um, but any material is um, deeply embedded with meanings, with um, cultural significance with uh, ritual and ceremonial significance that, um, you know, she wrote about uh, songs that women would sing that were related to indigo and the way that indigo dyed cloth was used to, um, to welcome uh, newborn babies into the world to wrap them, but it's also used to wrap um, the bodies of people who had died when they go to the afterlife or to um, their tomb, you know, 
So that this idea that this is a substance that has something to do with an entire life cycle. Um, and even though it wasn't a culture that I belong to, I think just reading about those things opened up a whole, like many, many different ways of thinking about the substance. So that was maybe the first time I really started thinking about Indonesia. So again, that sort of, it sunk into my, uh, my consciousness, I think. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in graduate school at Cranbrook Academy of Art um, in Michigan, uh, I decided I wanted to apply for a Fulbright grant to go somewhere in the world um, and study and, um, uh, and uh, expand my uh, awareness of the arts. And as I was trying to decide where I would go, um, you know, it made sense for me to go someplace where I could learn more about indigo dye, this material that I was so invested in. Um, and so I remembered that article. And so I started doing more research online and in books about uh, indigo dye cultures around Indonesia. And I became so fascinated. But then I also thought, well, I don't want to just go somewhere and pretend to be an anthropologist because I'm not, you know, I'm not a trained anthropologist. Um, you know, I, I need to make a project that has something to do with my whole, uh, the sort of the whole scope of my reality as an artist, as a contemporary artist. So I started researching about Indonesian contemporary arts as well um, and was very interested in how I saw um, a number of artists uh, sort of using uh, materials and signifiers from their sort of um, uh, ancestral roots or, or sort of um, culturally significant materials like batik or um, ceramics from Kasongan or, uh, you know, um, Wayang uh, shadow puppetry, these, um, art forms that have very long histories, but they were using them in the context of contemporary art as, as something to tell a story in a new way. So, um, so all those kinds of things really drew me to Indonesia, both because I felt like I needed to, if I was going to continue working with indigo dye, I needed to, you know, I needed to learn something more. I needed to be more culturally sensitive to at least you know, one of the places in the world where it's actually grown and processed and has been for a long time. So, yeah, many, many, many different layers to how I ended up coming to Indonesia. Um, and I arrived in 2012 the first time. So when you first uh, came to Indonesia, so where, where do you go? I, um, I first landed in Jakarta because I had to deal with all my visa stuff. Um, so, uh, but I, I lived in Yogyakarta uh, in central Java. Most of the time that I, um, that was my home base. Uh, so um, first I lived with a couple who were um, faculty at EC Yogyakarta, the art school in Jogja. And then I also spent uh, a lot of time in uh, Bali in a village called Badulu, um, pretty close to Ubud in central mm -hmm. Bali. And I lived with a family there who I'm still very close with and are very dear to me. Um, and then I also, I spent some time, not enough time, but I spent some time in Sumba, you know, because I felt I needed to go to that source of my original spark mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> of interest. Um, it was very hard to find people still using natural indigo dye uh, in that region when I was there. Um, and then I traveled around a bit other places, um, but most of my time was in Jogja. I love Indonesia. Um, my time there has been so important, not only to my personal growth and my understanding, my art, my writing, my research. It, it um, You know, there's something that happens and I'm sure you know this too, when you leave home and you go and you assimilate into a new culture, learn a new language, learn new ways of being and interacting with people, learning new culture. It's so valuable 
to the creative process, to the intellectual process, um, to kind of expanding one's self understanding. So I'm so grateful for my time spent in Indonesia because of course it was really beneficial for me personally in all those ways, but also I made so many dear friends there um, and they're so far away, but thankfully, you know, modern technology allows us to stay in communication. Um, but my impressions overall of um, Indonesia is that uh, it's an incredibly diverse country. You know, it's, I um, read someone described it as the, as an impossible country because there are so many different cultures, ethnicities, um, religious, um, uh, practices, you know, all in all these islands all over. So, uh, everywhere that I visited, um, I was so uh, amazed at the, the diversity of everyone and every culture that I visited. So I, I it's not a place that I can think of as sort of a homogenous mm-hmm. country culture, but the thing that I appreciated the most was how warm and inviting and hospitable and generous people are it was amazing to me everywhere I went I was welcomed and it was so easy to make friends so easy to get to know people because everyone was so open and curious um, and interested and it was really a pleasure you know to be the recipient of generous hospitality is it's such a gift and in terms of practices what learnings do you picked up from there Well, I, um, you know, I went uh, with the hopes of learning not only about uh, uh, textiles, um, batik and ikat weaving and indigo dyeing, other natural dyes. And I did, I learned quite a lot um, from many people, Um, but I also uh, was really interested in getting to know the contemporary art scene, um, which is part of why I chose to live in Jogja. Uh, because that's really um, one of the sort of centers for the contemporary arts. I think the arts are so um, diverse and complex there because there are so many different ways that people are engaging in creative work, um, you know, from uh, someone who is uh, still weaving a warp ikat in the same way as, you know, her ancestors um, using the same dyes, you know, someone who is making textiles in a very um, traditional and ancestral way. Um, And then there are people who are sort of creating these, um, these incredibly hybrid, uh, strange and interesting things um, to sell to foreigners, you know, Uh, so things that like, uh, are like quoting Mm -hmm. from traditional culture and, and, you know, but are easy to make and like mm-hmm. easy to sell. And so it's sort of like uh, symbols of culture that you can share <laughs> and make a good living. Um, so there's these like hybrid things. And then, mm-hmm. of course, you know, there's uh, artists working within the sort of um, realm of the contemporary arts. And I guess what that means to me is like artists who are making their um, artwork with the intention of showing it in galleries, international exhibitions like the Jogja Biennial or the Jakarta Biennial, um, and hoping to kind of show. Many people, of course, hope to show their art in uh, the galleries in Singapore. You know, that's mm-hmm. like a huge step in someone's career. Um, so there are all these different ways that I was exposed to the creative process, which was really useful for me to reflect on, you know, what is the nature of creativity when it comes down to it and um, to really think about uh, the sort of supposed differences between tradition and contemporary and, and where they meet. I spent a lot of, a lot of my time was hanging out in the, in many of the art spaces and uh, art collectives around Job mm-hmm. Um, which is how I came to understand about Nongkrong and how important uh, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you might want to elaborate more. What? <laughs> yes. So for those who aren't uh, familiar with what Nongkrong is, which it's um, what I came to understand is that it's a word. Uh, somebody once described it to me as uh, Nongkrong is like when you um, squat down by the side of the road with your cigarette and just like hang out with some people and and talk. And then you move on, you know, so it's like this, this temporary um, hanging out 
casual. It's not scheduled. It's um, uh, it just happens naturally. But I, it's funny. I um, as a sort of American researcher, and I felt all this pressure, you know, because I was um, I had these uh, institutions, these important institutions funding my projects. I felt this pressure to produce something, but I kept finding all I'm doing is like hanging out all the time. I'm just going to art shows and like hanging out with people and it's really great, but I'm not, what if I'm not getting anything done? You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not working. <laughs> but then when I started to talk to people about it, they're like, Oh no, 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 no crawling is really important. You know, uh, non crawling is how uh, artists kind of share ideas with each other. You know, when they're just hanging out, maybe they're hanging out, uh, having some snacks and coffee together or, uh, hanging out for an um, exhibition opening, but it became so clear to me that non this this process of just spending social time together um, is very nuanced, is very important. It's sort of like glue that holds the art scene together, and some people described it as uh, as kind of like school but the but like a good kind of school nice. like you can learn things that you don't get to learn in actual school um, by sharing ideas with friends so many 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 things I learned not only by engaging in non Kron, but then also starting to ask more questions about it and starting to kind of incorporate that into my uh, research and so the beginning was just hanging out and like um, drinking coffee and, and chatting uh, and so they invited me to hang out with them. And uh, I don't remember the exact context, but um, I think I was sort of describing like, oh, yeah, I've noticed like there's just, you know, I'm doing a lot of hanging out with people and people are always hanging out. And then someone was like, oh, yeah, that's non -crong. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and so then he explained to me a little bit and I said, oh, cool. There's a word for this. Okay. <laughs> And then, you know, everyone started to talk about, oh, yeah, Nong Krong is this and Nong Krong is that. And um, so then once I once I had that that understanding, that basic understanding someone had given me, then I just started asking people like, well, what does Nong Krong mm -hmm. mean to you? Mm -hmm. And and, you know, are we doing Nong Krong right now or <laughs> is this something else? <laughs> so every time I asked, that was when people got so excited. Um, that was the research topic they wanted me to be doing. <laughs> you know, they're like, ah, you know, you're interested in, in textiles and the sort of traditional and contemporary art. Yeah, that's interesting. But non -crong, that's really interesting. <laughs> and it was so um, delightful. It was just really lovely to... Um, it, it, Understanding non Krong helps me to feel like more of a, a sense of belonging in the in the culture around me. Um, I, you know, it's funny to say to to learn how to hang out, but it was a learning process. At first, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, very interesting that. Uh, yeah, you actually like. I mean, you wrote a whole paper or article yeah. about it, and I was like, yeah. oh, I mean, I knew what a non Krong is, and. Probably uh, as I've been in Singapore for a while where, you know, everything is like so uh, deadline driven. And so mm -hmm. when I yeah, did uh, here. my first Batik trip, I have a certain uh, so-called KPIs. Like, you know, I have to uh, spend like probably like two hours at one place mm -hmm. so that I managed to cover a few uh, artists or right. places to uh, do my research. And then... yeah. I mean, it just drags on, and I was like, yeah. it's impossible to. <laughs> you can't have a schedule. Plan things. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, interesting. You know, that was really one of my early lessons in assimilation. And yeah, you mentioned earlier about Indonesia, they are. Oh, there are artists uh, who are using uh, all these elements that is rooted based on ancestral practices mm. and how they include it in contemporary art. Uh, can you elaborate more about that? So when I was doing my research online before coming to Indonesia, I was finding information about a lot of the sort of early contemporary artists, people who were kind of coming of age in the 1980s and kind of making their more experimental artworks. 
then um, and then into the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, so I was, I had more familiarity with artists like, um, you know, Harry Dono is one, a very famous artist, um, uh, for example, and many others uh, who I saw were incorporating images or materials, whether it be Wayang Kulit shadow puppets or uh, other types of uh, like Wayang Golek materials, um, sort of maybe uh, taking parts of these kinds of uh, traditional um, puppets and then uh, creating something, um, incorporating them into an artwork, like a large installation that uh, included other elements. And it was clear that um, they were using these particular materials or these like symbolically important references to Javanese culture, um, not just uh, through Wayang, but through um, uh, batik, through traditional clothing, but that what was interesting to me was that it was clear that these were, uh, you know, contemporary artists. So they're, um, they're using these materials, not um, for the sort of the typical function that they would be used for, but they were using them as uh, materials, as sort of conceptual materials, things that could tell a story or that had an idea embedded, or maybe there was some element of um, uh, cultural critique in their artwork um, and that they were using these kinds of um, signifiers of Javanese culture, um, for example. So I was interested in that, you know, because it was clear that the context was the contemporary art, um, but a lot of the materials were coming from sort of historical um, art forms. Yeah, but then when I arrived um, with these kinds of things in my mind and these kinds of questions, and I started kind of looking around and talking to younger artists, um, uh, it sort of became clear that, you know, those kinds of questions weren't as important to artists at that time, you know, that this idea of, um, you know, uh, using cultural signifiers in their artwork wasn't always so important to people. People were just interested in making what they wanted to make. And so, you know, one person actually told me, oh, yeah, yeah, those things, you know, those are like um, the the old guard of the contemporary arts. You know, this is these are the kinds of things they're in, they were interested in. But, you know, people aren't so much interested in that anymore, um, which I think is only partially true. I think, mm-hmm. I think there's still plenty of that kind of mixing yeah. cultural mixing going on in the contemporary arts in Indonesia. But I was interested in those things because at the time I perceived that in the United States, in the sort of realm of the contemporary arts, there was no sort of lineage. There was no sort of like uh, a depth of roots of material. And I was interested in, you know, reaching deeper. I wanted to be a part of something, a part of a lineage. Um, and of course, in retrospect, I realized that, you know, much of that thinking was very naive. And of course, there are lots of different lineages and roots always being made and continued. But there was this feeling, and I think, you know, we've talked about this a little bit before, of this idea of like the immigrant culture. So everyone sort of come from somewhere else and, you know, all their roots have been cut off. And so we're just in this weird situation of making up something new (laughs) sort of inventing something new and yeah creating a new route yeah it's really where like the work that i made with my collaborators the craft mystery cult a lot of those Mm -hmm. questions you know we were thinking about a lot of those things yeah uh yeah one of the artwork that uh you showed uh probably part of the results that you're in indonesia the one that Mm -hmm. caught my eye was entitled uh, a setting for rituals involving indigo. So because I was researching at the moment about the natural dyes culture, uh, specifically mm-hmm. for uh, Batek. And then you did went to Jogja, so kind of like trying to dig a little bit more mm-hmm. about this work. Yeah, that is um, still one of, I think, the most important and special uh, artworks that I was involved in making. Um, I uh, didn't make that work alone. It was a collaboration. Um, and my collaborators, uh, Jovencio de la Paz and Stacey Jo Scott, we were all um, studying together in the same um, uh, 
school and um, doing our master's degrees. And Hovensi and I both work primarily with textiles and Stacy Joe works primarily with uh, ceramics. So mm -hmm. the three of us um, were really invested in and thinking a lot about uh, craft. So in some ways, I think um, when we talk about craft in the United States and in Europe, in this sort of contemporary context, um, it's sometimes like a code word for uh, tradition. <laughs> You know, the, like this is a, you know, craft is, is a way of sort of, you know, ways of making things that have deeper roots, right? So we were interested in, um, uh, you know, thinking about um, artistic uh, craft, um, the roots of making, um, the roots of the creative process. Um, we were really interested in these questions about a craft. And, and I think... Uh, what led us to um, to make that project a setting for rituals involving indigo dye um, was our collaborative uh, thesis project. Um, and so we were thinking uh, a lot about uh, ritual and also the sort of repetitive, the nature of, um, you know, many of these kinds of uh, media are um, involve physical repetition. You know, there's, Many people say, you know, oh, uh, weaving is very meditative or um, uh, spinning yarn is very meditative. Um, you know, uh, making pottery on a potter's wheel is, is meditative. But, you know, what does that actually mean? Um, I think it means that people kind of go into a sort of relaxed mental state because their hands are busy, because they're doing something that's very pleasurable with their hands um, that involves physical material. So we were thinking about all these different kinds of repeated gestures that are involved in craft media like textiles and ceramics and metalwork and woodworking. Um, and so that piece uh, we, um, uh, sort of created that uh, almost like an altar or a stage and then um, populated that space with um, all these different kind of uh, symbolic and um, evocative objects that we just sort of created intuitively. Um, and then there was a performance that would happen every single day in the museum um, uh, someone would come in dressed in a, a like a denim work shirt and black trousers, same kind of outfit, and they would enter the museum and they would take off their shoes, step onto the platform, and then they would perform one of these kinds of uh, gestures, repeated gestures that we came up with. Um, and they weren't necessarily demonstrating how you... Uh, dye something with indigo or how you make an object out of ceramics, but the gestures were meant to sort of evoke the feeling of, of being involved in those kinds of ways of making. So they were kind of poetic. Uh, Stacy Joe designed these beautiful um, porcelain vessels that were uh, water clocks. Um, so it's like an ancient, I think they were used as um, time keeping devices in ancient oh. Greece or, or something. You know, there would be a, a tiny hole in the bottom of a vessel mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, you would know how much time had elapsed when the vessel was finally full and sunk into mm -hmm. the water. So she created these uh, water clocks um, that someone uh, then would put place into the indigo and then sit very still and watch it slowly sink, fill with indigo and sink. And then she pulled it up, emptied it, and then put it aside on these um, uh, indigo dyed mats that we had also created. So everything was, you know, we were sort of playing around with this idea of, of ritual, mm -hmm. but we weren't using any specific ritual um, 
ceremonial culture that anyone, any one of us belonged to. It was sort of like uh, inventing a fiction, ceremonial fiction in a way. We wanted people to come away with it, you know, from viewing this with a sense of, you know, that they, that they were feeling something, that they were getting some, some kind of evocative feeling of um, the relationship of their own body and their own sort of agency mm-hmm. of making. Yeah, it was a really special project. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. So uh, as you mentioned, it's just intuitive. There is like no particular uh, symbolism that is yeah. being portrayed. We used some uh, techniques that were maybe more culturally specific. For example, cloths that we um, had dyed. We made these little mats that the those water clocks that I told you about that they would mm-hmm. sit on after they had come out of the indigo dye. And those um, were patterned um, with indigo using uh, shibori techniques, mm-hmm. um, which are common, um, uh, commonly associated with uh, areas uh, like uh, Japan and West Africa. Um, so different ways of sort of um, making a pattern by uh, folding or tying the cloth so that um, areas of the cloth uh, resist the dye. So mm-hmm. it's like a white and blue. So there was... That was maybe the only sort of really more clear link to any particular cultural art form. But otherwise, yeah, we were trying to just to kind of design things that were in our imagination. So yeah. when you come yeah. to Indonesia, is there a particular rituals that uh, people have been using? Hmm. Well, indigo. I was curious, of course, to to learn more about that, but... The primary thing that I observed, at least um, spending time in different locations in uh, Java, what I saw mostly was that people were um, trying to relearn how to use indigo dye, how to grow it, how to um, process the plant, how to um, make the dye um, fermentation uh, work, how to get a good color from it um, and that a lot of people are really struggling with this. So, um, cause it's difficult. It's a, it's, um, it's a living substance, indigo dye. It, it's moody. You know, people talk about it having uh, moods like a human. Um, and I, I can definitely attest to it from being a steward of indigo myself for many years. You know, it is particular, you know, if, it, if too much air gets in, to the liquid, then it just, it will just stop. It just stops. No more blue. And it will almost like it's going, "Mm -mm, mm -mm." Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to do this anymore. So it was interesting for me having training of using indigo dye um, in uh, different contexts and then observing how people were using it, sort of trying to relearn how to use it. For the most part, people were interested in kind of learning to use indigo again um, because they were interested in, um, yeah, like you were saying earlier, sort of sustainable practices and um, natural uh, substances, working with natural dyes. Um, but I definitely saw that there was, um, you know, that there was a gap in the knowledge that um, the sort of the lineage of indigo dyeing, um, the knowledge of how to do it had been interrupted um, in previous generations through the uh, colonial um, enterprises, uh, which is ironic because, you know, my understanding is that Dutch were very interested in batik and in imitating it and very interested in uh, uh, indigo dye as, um, as an export an export substance, you know? Um, so it's, it's interesting, yeah, that this sort of happened. But in other places, you know, I um, did see that, um, there was still definitely um, people were still practicing indigo in the ways that you know their grandmothers and great grandmothers had done. That you know there was this sort of uh, unbroken chain. Um, but I I never spent quite enough time in any one place to really understand fully what the the ritual culture was. So you know I, I hesitate to try and make any assumptions. Um, but, but yeah, for sure. I did 
in some places, especially um, in uh, Sumba and uh, Flores, some of the places I visited, um, you know, people did share a little bit about the sort of um, the ritual culture around indigo, uh, some of the rules and taboos and yeah, a lot of Zumba and Flores uh, woven cloth or indigo uh, or natural dye cultures are mm -hmm. uh, being passed on and mostly through oral uh, mm -hmm. educations like yeah uh, yeah so they just kind of like yeah apprenticeship with their uh, yeah. parents or grandparents yeah uh, yeah whereas yeah. I don't see a lot of that mentioned uh, in the Batik in Java. So, mm. as you mentioned, there's this gap. Uh, yeah, I observed that, um, you know, there there are things that have been lost. There's knowledge that has been lost through time. Um, and that's because of, um, you know, things being passed down through oral culture. Um, and there's a good reason to mourn for things that are lost. Uh, in those ways, uh, it makes it very hard for people of the current generation who want to be able to, you know, make whatever it is that they no longer know how to make. Um, it makes it very challenging, but there's something very um, exciting. There's a lot of energy um, and a, a spirit of a possibility. So, you know, not only are people sort of relearning how to do something the way it was done by their grandparents or great grandparents, but they're also incorporating their own um, ideas and influences into it. So they're kind of making new things happen. I think there's something really exciting about that also. Yeah. And coming back to your own, like what is your indigo ritual? Yeah. Cause it seems like it became a uh, kind of like seat. Uh, for you to like explore the other mm -hmm. stuff that is got like yeah. tied up with like other works uh the one that yeah. i saw probably like i'll tie my cloth to your cloth that yeah corporate yeah so it's the... it yeah that's another really special uh piece for me it's the only um, artwork I've made with batik. My, no, that's not true. That I made the uh, the batik with the star constellations for um, for uh, the craft mystery called collaboration. But this was a piece that I made. Um, I was thinking about um, you know uh, uh, sarong uh, um, that long piece of fabric that you know, you wind around your body and that's this sort of like this action of wrapping yourself, that there's something about that that's, um, you know, it's like uh, swaddling a baby in a way. So there's this, um, a, a tenderness to that kind of action of sort of wrapping oneself in textile. Um, of course, wearing batik can also be very constrictive you know, but, um, but I was thinking about it in that sort of poetic way. And I was thinking about this kind of cloth that, um, you know, I, I spent so much time in my life in Indonesia, really trying to understand, you know, and um, listening to people um, share their stories of the significance of different kinds of cloth, including batik. Um, and I was also thinking at the time about indigo dye as um, as a substance that's used in um, mourning rituals. So if someone has passed away, often in many cultures, you know, an indigo dyed cloth is used um, to to wrap their body um, um, or that the people who are in mourning would wear uh, blue um, or, uh, you know, in many cultures, including um, through that article that I referenced earlier, you know, I understood in, in Sumba, um, in West Sumba, there was a association of the indigo dye itself as being related to sort of the life cycle. So indigo is a fermentation. It kind of smells like decay. So it's sort of associated with a sort of transition of death, of thing, of loss. So I was thinking about all these things and I was thinking about it in relationship to how you know, how we as humanity are just really destroying this planet that we live on and rely on and um, 
we're doing a very poor job of being in good relationship with the natural world. So I was feeling very sad and heavy about that. Um, and so I think all these things were in my mind and in my heart. Um, and I went to a really amazing artist residency uh, in the mountains in Oregon. And I had a cabin um, all to myself in a studio. And I decided to make this work there. Um, and so all the imagery that's on that batik cloth are kind of related to um, ideas of transformation or regeneration or um, celebrating natural life cycles. So I said it, I created all this imagery and then I drew it on with uh, the chanting tool, um, trying really hard not to make any drips because I'm not a skilled batik artist. You know, that was really hard work to make that cloth. And then I dyed it in indigo. Um, and then uh, I created this um, uh, sort of video component to it um, where I uh, recorded myself, um, not only sort of wrapping myself in the cloth, um, but then also these little moments where I um, would be tying the end of my uh, sarong to, uh, to something else, to some significant object, whether it uh, it was a small tree or, you know, in one case, it was like the shoelaces of my father's running shoes. He's always been a runner um, or uh, the roots of a tree. Um, and I had that idea. Uh, and the title comes from a story that I had read um, of uh, another woman, Catherine McKinley, who had been a Fulbright scholar and went to study about indigo in uh, West Africa. And she um, wrote this wonderful book about her experiences um, titled Indigo, and uh, her name is Catherine McKinley. Um, and she was telling a story about um, a friend of hers, um, her closest friend, whose uh, husband suddenly passed away. And through the sort of um, the process of mourning, uh, she described an incident when um, a neighbor came over to visit um, the widow uh, who had just lost her husband. And she uh, made this gesture um, where she knelt down and she tied the end of her wrapper cloth, the skirt she was wearing to the end of her friend who had just lost her husband. And she said, you know, something to the effect of, um, you know, oh, my friend, you know, we're, we're in this together, we're here together. Let me tie my cloth to your cloth. And, um, and, and I thought that that, you know, that gesture just really stuck with me when I read it, this I idea of tying your cloth to another's cloth is such a beautiful, poetic uh, way of um, showing care, but also honoring um, the pain of loss the pain of um, mourning someone who has died or as I was thinking about it in the time, mourning the loss of, um, uh, of uh, animals and uh, health of our environment and uh, across the world. And so that gesture and that little phrase from that story, again, like all these layers of about indigo, they sort of bubble up for me. Um, and so I kind of use that to try and tell a story through actually through making that cloth, but also through then kind of activating it or um, using it in this, uh, again, in a sort of repeated uh, sort of ritualized um, gesture. Um, and so I, I, I recorded see those little images, the sort of video images, video stills um, of tying the end of the cloth to something. Yeah, that is a uh, really beautiful, uh, the, it's kind of like a symbolic way to show your ties with uh, Indonesia and your relationship yeah. and how uh, it kind of like lives with you, you know, the spirit yeah. that lives within you, yeah. Oh, yeah, really yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it's that's that's why I said that piece is really special to me. It's like I think one of the 
artworks that um, maybe have the most heart in it. You know, there's a lot of my heart in it. Yeah, the sort of warm feelings. Yeah, for sure. What What are some of the uh, ongoing projects? Uh, Stacy, Joe, and Hovensu and I have been talking recently about, um, and we talk about this every now and then, but I think, you know, we're really going to pursue um, an idea that we've had for a long time of uh, remaking that our original artwork, um, the setting for rituals involving indigo dye, to make that work again. Um, uh, but in different ways. Uh, and we've had this idea of, um, of traveling to different places, um, where some of the, the people are, are, um, our peers in grad school who performed in that original, um, artwork, uh, to visit them. You know, we have some friends who live in Los Angeles. We have, uh, a friend in Oslo, Norway, and uh, Stacy Joe, and we'll be traveling there next fall, uh, in next November, to um, to make a collaboration with her. Um, so you know, there's all these people around, and then the three of us, of course, um, to kind of cre recreate the the piece as sort of like a traveling temporary uh, exhibition, um, and so. Yeah, I love this idea. I'm really excited about it. So that's a related um, thing that's currently cooking. Mm -hmm. um, so be like fingers very crossed. Interesting. Yeah, very yeah. interesting to find out. Any uh, final thoughts to sum up our conversation today? Well, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I mean, in many ways, it's, uh, it's really a gift for me um, to be asked to reflect on these um, different experiences in my life and also some of these really important artworks that I've made and materials that I work with. Um, you know, it was uh, 2012 that we made that um, a setting for rituals involving indigo dye together. So that's, you know, nine years ago or so. Um, and so it's been a long time since we made that important work. So it's it's been really nice. It's been really special for me to have a reason to revisit those things. And I think it's opened up a lot of new ideas. Um, but also, you know, all of this, like all the things that I've been talking about, the experiences that I've had and things that I think about in my own artwork, all of that um, informs how I teach also. And I think that's an important thing to maybe um, Mark is that my relationships with Indo um, Indonesia, um, things that I've learned there, all of that, you know, is it's it's processed in my own, you know, mind and, and imagination and heart, but it also has all really influenced my and my teaching, you know, and um, this sort of broader perspectives that I've gained through those amazing experiences and living in another culture, I'm able to pass on to my students in some ways too, which, you know, I think I'm really glad. So, you know, again, there's like, uh, it, it's sort of like oral culture. I'm involved in oral culture, I feel, as a lecturer. <laughs> Maybe that's overly optimistic thing to say, but um, <laughs> in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them, I'm sharing stories, I'm sharing examples of artwork um and uh so i feel like that's a really uh wonderful and important way that i can kind of continue giving the gift that um, has been given to me by so many people all right thank you so much sonia for your yeah. time to nongkrong today <laughs> yeah thank you so much tony this has been such a pleasure really nice to spend the time with you in conversation <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you do enjoy this interview. If you like this, uh, do check out our previous interviews with other guests over on our IGTV or over on our website. And do remember to follow us at Inner Gallery across our social media, Facebook and Instagram to find out more about our future events and happenings. And until next time, stay safe and take care.